welcome to you all. Good afternoon or, or uh, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar, um, where we are discussing embedded SIM connectivity. So we have a really a packed uh, webinar session for you this afternoon. We have a lot of insights to share, um, including new um, including new insights from Collider Intelligence and our research and expert inputs from Telet and Idemia. So panel discussions, live audience question and answers, there's a lot that we have to share with you and we're looking forward to it. So on that note, let us move on. So my name is John King. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Collido Intelligence, and I will be your moderator for today's session. In a moment, I'll give a short recap on how you can engage with us today, because we want to hear from you as we go. But first, let us give a quick uh, introduction to the different speakers that we have. So we have uh, with us uh, Ayo Yasmin, who's Director of Product Management for IoT and Connectivity at Telit. We have uh, Pascal Duanyu of uh, IoT Client Success at Idemia. And we have Stefan Sol, who's the Chief of Research also from Collider Intelligence. Uh, gentlemen, it is great to be with you today. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to share. Um, to start with, why don't you come up and just say a, a quick introduction of, of your roles within your respective companies for the audience. Um, maybe we start with yourself. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Eyal, I'm the product manager in the Intelit, in the connectivity business unit, uh, responsible for all the, the CMP and the uh, SIM uh, management, as you see later on, and uh, happy to be here with, with you and with Kaledio. Hello everyone, Pascal Devagne, uh, working in Idemia Connectivity Services Business Unit in charge of working for the IoT business line, in charge of connectivity and security aspects. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Stefan Sorrell, Chief of Research at Kilido, responsible for uh, our cellular IoT research, looking at IoT roaming, eSIM, private networks, as well as uh, mobile security and, and fraud as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, so, quickly given a recap then of the agenda uh, that we are going through today and how you, the audience, can uh, take part as well. So, as mentioned, today we are discussing the case for embedded SIM connectivity. Now, this is one of the core research areas that we cover at Collido. And today we'll be sharing some of the insights from our latest research into this area conducted uh, just in this last quarter and Stefan will lead that section. We'll then move to a panel discussion where we'll be addressing some of the key yes, questions that we see from the industry, the most pertinent questions. So Stefan, uh, Ayo and Pascal will, will handle that. Before then, as you can see, we move over really to, to get in the view from the ground where Telet and uh, Idemi was, as partner in firms will share with us about really how they're enabling end users with these solutions. So there will be a lot to share in these sessions. And finally, we will finish up with a live audience question and answers. Um, and now this is the bit where, um, where we really want to hear from you as well. So to engage with us on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a, a Q and A section. Um, please use this, I mean, in, so there's a chat function as well, but we, we do prefer to have questions through the Q and A functionality. So if you expand on this and uh, type in your questions to all panelists as we go, then we will get through as many of those as possible in the designated uh, Q&A section at the end. Um, there's over, I think we have over 200 registrations for the webinar today, which is fantastic. So um, there might be many of you with us, but we still want to hear from as many of you as, as possible. And uh, experience does tell us that if there's a question that you have in your mind, then one of your peers on the webinar will probably echo that as well. So please, don't hold back and, uh, and share away as we go. Okay, but on this note, I think that's, uh, because there's a lot to get through, I think it's a good point to hand over. So, um, Stefan, I will let you lead us in the first section, which is why embedded SIM connectivity? Yep, thanks, John. Um, yeah, so I think to, uh, to set the background, you know, why embedded SIM connectivity, I think we have to look at uh, what's happened in the past 
uh, in terms of cellular uh, IoT connectivity and how that has been enabled, um, why that in particular, that those processes behind that have created challenges in the industry and why that needs to and is now being being changed. So, I mean, this might be familiar to, to a lot of people on the webinar, but um, I think, yeah, we need to really reiterate what uh, some of the what some of the issues have been in the past. So when we look at how connectivity was provisioned, um, you know, everyone is familiar with the plug in SIM. That's how it works in uh, in your smartphone today. Um, and that's how it's often still deployed in, in IoT uh, in, across uh, several different industries. Um, the, the problem with that really is, is that it's a physical process. And uh, you know, more than likely, these types of SIMs only carry uh, one particular operator profile on the SIM card. Um, so if there's any desire to change uh, to a, a different network operator, whether that's on cost grounds, whether that's on other uh, needs, such as performance, for example, um, in most cases, you're gonna have to go to the device, uh, take out the SIM card and plug a new one in. So that's very inefficient. I mean, the, the, the truck roll cost can be significant. Um, another issue associated with, uh, with the plug-in SIM is you know, if you're, you're adding connectivity at the production stage, what we often see is uh, whole lines of different color-coded SIM cards to be inserted in, in various devices, depending on where they're, they're gonna be shipped across the international stage. Um, again, that is very inefficient from a, from a business process point of view. So what we see then uh, resulting from that is um, unnecessary costs, first of all, involved in the uh, deployment of the connectivity itself, um, unnecessary potential costs in future if there is any desire to change the commercial relationship with the operator, um, with the end impact, really, that uh, it's very difficult to, to scale IoT under that kind of, of model. I mean, we recently conducted a very large enterprise IoT survey, just under 760 different enterprises uh, uh, surveyed. And um, really what you have is a situation of where you need to have different kind of relationships with various connectivity providers because of these um, issues I've just talked about with the traditional SIM process. It really does create massive complexity in the environment. Um, and we can see there that uh, some 56% of survey respondents felt the same way and, and really thought that was a, a barrier to cellular IoT. We go to the next slide. Um, we also should be looking at how IoT is enabled from an international perspective. IoT is very commonly uh, deployed not only in domestic scenarios, but companies want to ship their products internationally. They want connectivity internationally. That, uh, historically, that's been supported through uh, traditional uh, mobile roaming agreements, which are based on uh, short-term travel, uh, predictable data use, um, because that's how I, consumers and, and business travelers will, would use their mobile devices when they're abroad. Now, obviously, the situation is very different in the IoT landscape. You can have devices that phone home perhaps just once a day, transmitting a tiny amount of data. You can have other types of devices that need uh, really high throughput and, trans uh, and transport gigabytes of, of, of data across the, the network. So there's a huge mix of uh, behavior and that doesn't really reflect the uh, historical commercial setup for roaming. Um, because of that, we're seeing an increase in uh, let's say hostility to uh, the practice of what's known as permanent roaming. So where IoT devices are shipped to a location, they'll stay in that particular location for you know, perhaps well over a year, perhaps even up to a, a, a decade or even more. So they're, they're not uh, behaving in the same way as a consumer or business traveler. They are that, in that country roaming permanently. Now that raises concerns on the part of regulators and operators in terms of what does that mean for my network? What does that mean for my own domestic business, for example? So we're seeing a large, uh, we're seeing an increase in 
of what I would call hostile activity to uh, either legislate or effectively uh, prevent uh, uh, permanent roaming from, from scaling. Um, and that in turn, again, which I talked about a little bit before, increases the need to engage with multiple different providers to, to support connectivity under the legacy SID model when you're looking at international deployments. On the subject of permanent roaming itself, I mean, we can see there on the right, again, from the same survey, a significant proportion of, uh, of survey respondents have, uh, have concerns over, over permanent roaming because of the growing number of countries that are looking to restrict it from a regulatory as well as from an MNO point of view. Next slide, please, John. So, so that kind of leads on to why embedded SIM uh, itself. I mean, the embedded SIM has uh, perhaps a fairly long history. I mean, plug-in SIMs are consumer grade by default. Um, and then as a result, you have the development of the MFF2 form factor, which is there to uh, support things like temperature extremes, vibrations, and so on for uh, more rigorous use cases, let's say. But that's not the whole story with embedded SIM. Uh, more recently, we've seen the GSMA work with the industry to develop a standard uh, for EUICC, so eSIM, um, which allows uh, remote subscription management of the SIM. So you can swap operator profiles over the year, you don't have that lock-in risk or effective lock-in risk associated with a plug-in SIM or a single profile in FF2 SIM, for example. Um, and it means that um, if you need, for whatever reason, to, to change operators, you have the technical capability to do so. Um, we're also seeing now the emergence of iSIM, the integrated SIM, where the SIM card itself is integrated into the system on chip. So that reduces uh, the bill of materials, reduces power consumption, um, decreases the amount of space required to, to support connectivity. So win-win for a, a lot of different use cases. And um, in sh shortly, we'll see uh, ISIM um, supporting that standardized uh, GSMA UICC specification across the, across the industry. Um, we're also seeing a, a large amount of deployments, uh, especially on, among IoT MBNOs, using uh, what's known as multi imz technology. So that operates in a similar manner to, to eSIM, uh, but in a non-standardized way to switch uh, different, uh, shall we say, profiles uh, over the air to optimize that uh, connectivity. Um, that's not to say that the current landscape is all, all, uh, all roses. I mean, there are technical, legal, and commercial challenges associated with uh, eSIM. Uh, in the IoT landscape, and for that reason, the GSMA is now in the process of uh, developing its IoT specification, which will reduce some of those pain points. But uh, really, what we're looking at uh, for now is, is a, a, a need for flexibility in those deployments. So while there are some issues with, associated with eSIM alone, uh, if you add multi imsi on top of that on the same card, then you have a pretty flexible flexible solution. Um, just a quick uh, data point here, if you look on the uh, chart to the, to the right, I mean, perhaps for some of the reasons uh, behind uh, the complexity of, uh, of eSIM that's going on, uh, we see, you know, there's just over 60 million active, so I call them XUICC connections, so that's uh, eSIM and iSIM, but you see an enormous amount of growth uh, moving to 2027 for, you know, because of that simplification that's happening in the industry and because of that need, to support a scalable model for, for IoT. There's three other segments uh, listed in, in, the, uh, in the chart there. And I think those ones are particularly important when we consider um, you know, the need for embedded SIM. And we'll have a look at those uh, on, the, on the next slide or, or explain some of the reasons why they might be used in the, in the next slide. So I'm just going to close this uh, section out um, just to build the business case for, for embedded SIM. I mean, we've seen, uh, I mean, when we look at, for example, telematics, EV charging and, and healthcare, I mean, often you need those devices to be uh, in the field for a long time. You can't have any risks associated with permanent roaming. You want to ensure that that connectivity is always available or as much as, uh, uh, as is feasibly possible. Um, you can't achieve that with, say, a plug-in SIM. 
Um, in other areas, uh, particularly, you know, uh, telematics and, and EV charging, I mean, those devices are exposed, devices, those objects are exposed to the outside elements for, for long periods of time. So you need a ruggedized solution, which uh, means you need an embedded SIM. Um, we also see, you know, a large proportion of, uh, of these types of players distributing their products internationally, and they want their devices to just work wherever they are. They don't want the complexity that's involved with the, you know, the legacy type solution, SIM solutions that I've, I've talked about initially. Um, and of course you want, because of that long life cycle, to make sure that you don't run into any legal trouble and, and so on. So you need that flexibility associated with eSIM. Um, of course, there are challenges with uh, particularly uh, eSIM right now. I mean, um, you can't just uh, expect the eSIM to, to work with any device, for example. You must have some testing and de uh, device component inter interoperability testing to make sure that uh, everything uh, between the device communications operates as, as expected, as well as the, fa uh, the fact that it should be working on any networks that you expect it to. Also, what we see in the industry is where, for example, some MNOs may offer eSIM. Um, when you want to switch providers, you encounter some of those, uh, those difficulties in the fact that the whole platform has to be migrated from uh, MNO A to MNO B, and, and that really is a, a significant cost. Um, we, we see quite a few IoT MVNOs, on the other hand, who avoid that by having, for example, uh, different profiles available for use across their connectivity platform so that that particular migration challenge is, is not uh, encountered. And uh, finally, uh, or the last two really are concerned the, the levels of support. You want your devices uh, operating at the levels you expect, you want performance levels to be consistent. You want issues to be solved as, as, fa as fast as possible. At the connectivity level, that means you want to have um, telecoms infrastructure set up and integration set up. So you have uh, you, whoever correct connectivity partner you have has those uh, necessary integrations to have full visibility of what's happening to devices. Um, for example, where that's not the case, you may get uh, uh, an instance of a, uh, a visited operator who's uh, supporting that connection, viewing the customer as a as a low priority. They don't want to sort out any issues. On the other hand, you might have some uh, technical issues at the device level itself. So you want that expertise to, uh, to sort those kinds of problems uh, out as fast as possible and uh, ensure you know, maximum reliability of, of the overall solution so you can extract value. Um, so that concludes my, uh, my presentation. I'm gonna hand back over to John. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, I think there's some good insights uh, already that you've shared, and, and actually it, it fits very nicely then going into the first panel session in some of the areas that you discussed. So um, I think this is an ideal moment to uh, bring back in uh, Aon and Pascal alongside yourself to go through some of these questions. Um, now, before we do, uh, just just a, another note to the audience, and, and maybe for some of you who, who joined us a bit late, um, Again, we want to hear all your questions, as many as possible as we go. Please use the, uh, the Q&A section on the right hand of your screen to do that. So if you expand that section, then you can type your question to all panelists. Um, the reason I say that is because I've seen a couple um, really good comments come in on, on chat. Uh, so uh, Alex, if you're listening, we see your one. Um, but um, yeah, great, great if you're able to put those through the Q&A instead. And um, one from Glenn as well about uh, Will the presentation be coming through? And the answer is yes, the presentation will be coming through to you. In fact, what we're presenting to you today, these new insights are available uh, in a new white paper that is launching today. And so everyone who is registered and with us in today's live event, you will be the first to get your hands on this new white paper and a link to which will be sent through after the event today. Um, coming back though to the, uh, to the panel discussion. So I think if we, if we look to build on from what Stefan has been sharing in this first session. There were four, I would say, pertinent areas that um, to our expert speakers, I would love to get your feedback and views on. So aligned to that, let us let us kick off. And I guess I guess at the outset, we're talking about embedded SIM connectivity. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna 
uh, ask this question um, ALT yourself, and it's and it is simply put: What are the what are the main advantages of the embedded connectivity offering? Okay, there, there are many advantages over here. I think the, the most one of the most important one is the we reduced all the device engineering and the operational complexity when we have one one solution coming. The, it's also a smaller form factor. As mentioned, if the SIM is inside the module, they don't need any any additional place for that. The the lower uh, bill of material and the TCO is is the improvement here. Also, from security point of view, it's making the SIM almost uh, impossible to to be removed or be taken out or be stolen when the SIM is inside the module. There are also some advantage from lo logistic point of view when you are ordering the module and you have one one box that you need to order or one device and not uh, not several uh, uh, taking the, the module itself and the SIM itself and need to sort it inside from logistic you need to wait for to get uh, two two orders to invoice when you do the the the, the, the ordering for that the shipment is even uh, uh, simpler uh, you don't need to connect the SIM you don't need to solder the SIM itself or to connect it physically uh, it's also more robust uh, don't, there's no, no way that you need to uh, to put the SIM inside. Uh, there are many advantages in this uh, in this solution. No, thank you, thank you, El, and and stay with me actually because um, I'm going to come straight back to you on the next one because you mentioned complexity there, and this is one of the advantages in your first point, and that is that is an area that we see ourselves and collided through our research so much when we look at the different challenges in the market you know the complexity of the ecosystem and then and, you know, bringing these different solutions together you know as especially if you're sending this proposition to someone who's not too au fait with the terminology so given that there's a lot of talk about complexity especially in the deployment of cellular IoT devices can you comment on can you comment on some of these and i guess share about how embedded connectivity can help mitigate them. Okay, so as mentioned earlier by Stefan, and I also will cover this in my presentation later on, there are many, many challenges today in the IoT ecosystem. There's the permanent roaming restriction, there's the uh, visit network are uh, increasing the inbound roaming uh, to recover some lost revenue they have. There, there's request for redundancy uh, functionality and uh, for mission critical uses. As well, when we see new technologies in the uh, coming, the new roaming commercial, we need to have all the agreement with them. So we did it with the embedded connectivity, uh, mainly when we are having the, the remote profile uh, modification and, and, and provisioning. Uh, also with the multi IMSI that mentioned cover later on, the UICC. So we have uh, all the ability to, to from remotely to handle all these uh, modification without the need to, to, to change them. Uh, as well, the uh, the price, as I mentioned, the price will be uh, better here as well as the logistic uh, domain for that. No, perfect. Thank you. I think that's uh, very helpful. Um, now, for, for for the next point, um, Pascal, I think I will come to yourself for the next point. And I know Stefan touched upon this in the slides that he he shared at the outset um, about the um, upcoming IoT specification. You know, and and um, and what that's meant to, I guess, help resolve. You know, um, so that I guess I'd like to understand. You know, what will the IoT specification mean for eSIM? So, will it help simplify the market? Yes, because uh, what we've seen is that the the M two M RSP specification uh, was really powerful, but quite complex in terms of implementation. And while we've seen a huge success in some big industries like automotive. Uh, it was not really uh, working as the, the way we would, we would want for the IoT because it lacks the flexibility and the scalability that we need and that our customer need. So the idea of this new specification is to get the best from the consumer specification with no dedicated one-to-one -one integration every time we need uh, basically an OEM wants to onboard a new MNO. And the the ability to address uh, devices without any interface like the M2M1 was doing. So that's what uh, the JSMA has been working on. And I really think that that will be a key lever to make sure that we can uh, expand those RSP features to all the IoT devices. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. Yes, no go. 
Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. No, okay. And um, and there's 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 one more question that we'll address now. And um, Stefan, we've, we've kept you quiet till now, so uh, let let me come back to you. So um, let's talk a little bit then about multi ENSI. So multi ENSI is proprietary. So does that not introduce lock in effects as well? So if if that is the case, I'm keen to get your feedback. You know, how do you ensure the best experience? Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, Al is probably gonna address some of this in his slides. I think first things first, um, yes, multi MZ is a proprietary implementation. Does it produce lock-in? Um, when you consider that, um, you know, more and more we're seeing IoT connectivity specialists pair um, multi MZ with eSIM, um, those two combined uh, technologies uh, help you avoid that particular lock-in. I mean, mostly what you're doing with multi MZ is to uh, ensure some sort of optimization to to the connectivity. So you're using um, mostly different roaming sponsors. In some cases, uh, even able to localize the connection. But um, essentially, what you have is then um, the ESIM capability to ensure that you know if you don't want to stay with the provider AU as multi MZ, then you still have that option to um, let's say jump ship and, and move to to a different commercial relationship um, in terms of the best experience i mean historically we've seen some multi mz implementations where we have uh, i suppose a static uh, mz lists um, on the sim card those can't couldn't be updated so they weren't really a great technical solution um, what we're seeing now more and more is uh, first of all a sort of over the air capability to um, update that particular list. We're also seeing some activity in terms of uh, some logic on the SIM to uh, ensure that uh, connectivity or switching is activated even if a service is not available. So the SIM card will try and search for an available network automatically. Um, so we're seeing some certain improvements uh, in the overall user experience. And as I said, when you combine it with eSIM, then that lock-in is avoided. That's perfect. Thank you, Stefan. And I, th I think you're right. I know that to an extent, as you mentioned, that's going to tie into what um, uh, Al and uh, Pascal share with us in the next section. So, in in some ways, that's a nice segue that that we then uh, uh, move on. So, um, and before we do, um, I, again, I'll, I'll give a quick reminder to keep the questions coming. I see quite a few coming in, which is which is fantastic, and we will have a dedicated time at the end to address as many of those as possible. Um, but before we get there, let's move on to the next section. So this is where we'll hear the views directly from Telet and Idemia as, as, as experts working to, together in the industry to help end users you know, with connectivity solutions. So um, on that note, Ayal, I will hand over to yourself. Thank you, John. Okay, so I, I will start with the high level overview the future uh, proofing global IoT connectivity. So the global cellular ecosystem evolution is caused disruption to the worldwide connectivity and uh, to IoT itself. On the left side, uh, you can see the, the main obstacle or the main challenges that uh, we need to handle in the, in the IoT today. So there is the, there are the regulation or commercial decision that, make, uh, that may block the IoT device with a permanent roaming restriction. On top of that, there are, uh, as mentioned earlier, some visited network that are trying to, to recover revenues by adding cost to the IoT device. So they're increasing the, the inbound roaming rates in order to, to recover those lost. There are more and more applications that uh, required backup and uh, redundancy and functionality for mission critical uh, use cases. And uh, the new technologies require the new roaming uh, commercial agreement which required uh, more testing and sometimes additional implementation on site. So to overcome all of these, we have the IoT and we know we need to offer a full solution as described in this slide, but uh, in this presentation, I will focus only on the SIM technology part and they explain how this is uh, used for uh, embedded connectivity and for the, the SIM uh, solution. A few words about history of the SIM in the history of the embedded SIM. So uh, the first SIM generation is uh, the traditional SIM that we are all aware of. This is the, the basic uh, SIM socket with the plastic SIM 
which insert it inside to the socket. And when we need to, to switch the connectivity, we just need to replace the plastic seam with, with another plastic. In the second generation, we have been uh, introduced to the, the eSIM, as mentioned earlier, also known as the embedded SIM. It is the, the MFF2 form factor, where the SIM is soldered uh, to the PCB itself. Uh, this is a smaller size uh, SIM and uh, it saves some space, as well as it's more uh, reliable, but still it's costly and they need to be soldered and they require the real estate on the, the board itself. In the next generation, uh, the third and the fourth, depends how, how we look on them, uh, you can find the embedded solution. But the SIM is part of the, the module itself. So, we, so in the SIM on chip solution, the SIM is physically inserted into the module. It's a standard SIM, standard physical SIM, but uh, much smaller. And it includes the, its RSP, or the remote SIM provisioning capabilities inside, inside the module itself. And the, the iSIM, the integrated SIM, it's a, it's a SIM that is a piece of software which is a integrally part of the, of the module itself. So, so what, what are the main features and capability that uh, we should expect from the embedded uh, connectivity solution? First, as I presented in, the, in my first slide, we need to have a future-proof solution meaning we need a, a solution, a platform, that will be able to support all the SIM type that uh, the user will may need. The solution should support all the network technology and the standard, like uh, CAT1, CAT4, CAT1Bs, uh, CATM, 5G, etc., and the, that will come to the technology. And also we need to be able to have a global uh, connectivity coverage for that. Second, uh, the SIM must be managed and controlled from remote as mentioned over the air, for flexibility and for future modification and profile switch for the connectivity. Uh, it should uh, support the future SIM technology with the advanced SIM chip capabilities like a SIM applet and the SIM toolkit. Uh, as well, the solution needs to be able to support local profiles in the required region. So this is uh, correct also for, for the module, that the, the module themselves uh, need to be certified in the local required region, and sometimes also we need the MNO certification for the specific module. And the last, this need to be aligned with the market requirement and the standard specification of ISIM, as we know there's a specific, specific uh, requirement for the ISIM uh, regulation. Uh, there are more and more uh, difference and more SIM uh, options in the new SIM technologies and form factor that are available in the market today, uh, as presented in this slide. Uh, per your business case, you should uh, select the relevant SIM for, for your use. Some of the SIM uh, in, the, in this slide can, uh, can be considered as MVNO advantage and the other as a module vendor advantage. Based on, uh, on that, and per the same technology, we as the industry uh, can support the variants of embedded connectivity solution for the for each use case. Okay. Um, on this one, I wanted to show the, the evolution that we already covered it before uh, with Stefan, but just a recap of what we've been doing, uh, especially in Edimia on this one. Uh, started with the uh, standard SIM more than uh, 30 years ago now, and we've seen embedded, the embedded SIM, like the MF2 just described by AL, uh, appeared more than 10 years ago now. And in the past, let's say five years, we've been working both on integrated SIM and also embedded in much lower form factor, uh, both being able to offer the kind of flexible connectivity we've just discussed and also add some um, security uh, by design features in order to leverage the usage and the presence of, uh, of a scene. And if we move to the next slide, I think just some practical insights on the difference of form factors that, that we can find here. So you can have a practical look at a uh, difference between the SIM socket, which is here the, the smallest one, the 4FF, the nano SIM, uh, that's where we were. That's what we were using until quite, quite recently, and now we've moved to both 
uh, ozone 8 form factor, like the one in yellow, which is only two by two millimeters. So the footprint on, um, on the device board is much lower. And also, of course, working on some integrated solutions uh, where, the, uh, where we are leveraging on the security features that we are developing together with the chip makers and integrating with the module makers like Telit to make sure that we can um, achieve a level of security that will be approved and uh, approved by the, the local uh, the local MNOs who are extremely sensitive to this uh, to this topic. Thanks, Pascal. So let's talk about the different uh, SIM technology. The, the multi imz uh, is the first one. So the IMZ is a unique identifier of the AOM MNO when we are uh, roaming. Therefore, multi imz is uh, several IMZ that are populated in one in one SIM. The multi imz application has uh, the ability to switch between different sponsored IMZ, which include in that uh, specific SIM, according to, to predefined rules or by a specific request or specific trigger to modify the IMSI, which can be done uh, or over the air or by a local command for the, the SIM. Ultimately, the multi IMSI is a solution to create better roaming footprint, thanks to the availability of the multi, multiple IMSI, which belong to, to more roaming uh, sponsors. So that you can uh, choose the option with either the best price or the best coverage. As well, it is a good uh, solution for mission critical case where one IMZ is down, so you can continue and work in with the, the other IMZ. So if this solution is so good, why why don't we don't see it uh, too often? First, the, it is, this is a complex uh, solution, required complex uh, development. Second, the uh, MNO themselves cannot or do not want to, to offer it as the, they will offer only their own, uh, their own IMZ. Uh, small MVNOs and reseller, which are based on uh, MNO system, as well are, uh, or as well as, uh, as well are, uh, don't have these, uh, the resources and R&D capabilities for those uh, development. At last, uh, we can find the message in the market that uh, this solution is not uh, required, mainly when we are moving to UICC. However, this is not, uh, not fully accurate. The second type of uh, the new technology and the second definition is the EUICC. It's uh, short for Embedded Universal Integrated Circuit Card. EUICC is the capability, uh, the feature of a SIM to be remotely provisioned over the air, including uh, MNO swap, uh, the RSP mechanism is uh, specified by uh, two GSMA master document. One is for uh, consumer and the other one is for the M2M use case. Uh, the USC definition uh, have nothing to do with the physical form factor of the SIM. So the USC can be, it can be a, a traditional SIM card, the, the plug-in plastic one. It can be a SIM on chip uh, soldered to the PCB or a piece of software that uh, Emulating the same functionality and running inside uh, the SOC. Uh, there's another popular term that uh, uh, heard before by uh, Stefan, we, we all heard about is the eSIM. So sometimes it's uh, commonly used in the, in the market uh, as a synonymous of, of UICC. However, there's a slight uh, different uh, connotation. It's, it is, is usually referred to the, to the specific form factor, the MFF2, that is the, the SIM chip, uh, which can be sold on the PCB. So also this one is uh, the RSP capabilities. So you can say that the eSIM is, uh, is usually referred to the SIM chip, while the USCC is a technology uh, which allow us to do the download, to switch and to, to active profile from remote. But again, the eSIM and uh, the they are sometimes are uh, meaning for the same. All in all, the, the key point here is that uh, thanks to the RSP and to the remote uh, service provisioning, uh, USC allows for the flexibility of changing the connectivity provider during the lifetime of the device without a costly visit to the device to do the physical uh, SIM swap. In addition, the device owner gain instant management and uh, control, capabil control capabilities to, for a single uh, efficient uh, platform. This is uh, the, last, the last term 
for this presentation is the IUICC, also known as ICIM. So this is a trusted and the secure OS emulating the, the same uh, functionality this is running in a trusted and the secure area of the, of the SOC, the system of chip. It, usually it's the cellular modem chipset and it's not a discrete hardware secure element like the UICC. It's the secure element in that case is the ICIM that it's inside the SOC. There are already in the market uh, some examples of ICIM. One of them is the, the Telit Simwise, which is our brand of the ICIM from uh, 2018. And you can find the uh, other solution from different provider. As mentioned earlier, the, there is not a standard spec yet. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing process, but uh, uh, assume it will become the standard for this one. The RSP capabilities of, of the UICC is exactly the same as the UICC. For the UICC and the UICC, it is the same, the same RSP. So if I recap for a second, the uh, here we can you can uh, see some more visual way of uh, our path to offer one single global sim to the embedded uh, to the embedded solution in the module and to offer a global coverage for uh, all the embedded connectivity solution. So we have a standalone uh, reseller solution with a single MNO sim, the standard sim. Adding that we have the multi MZ solution that provide flexibility, optimization, backup, and redundancy with a strong IMSI. Uh, but the benefit, as I mentioned, is the footprint for global deployment and coverage. And finally, we have the EUICC that give us the ability to switch between the different profile and enjoy the ability to do localization, which as you can see, it's also include the multi MZ as one of the profile. So also uh, sometimes the, the multi MZ also using a, a function of the bootstrap in the, in the SIM. Uh, obviously, it's bring us to, to a huge number of supported network and basically uh, no restriction in the in a specific uh, location. So to, to recap uh, my part here, uh, we're not talking about event connectivity. Uh, we need to look for the following capabilities. We need a solution that is a future proof where you can go off and enhance to global coverage and for global uh, deployment. Uh, you need uh, to be able to work both with a SIM on chip like the, the new US N8 as well with the iSIM solution to work with a vendor who provide you a complete offering for different technology and region support. As mentioned, the CAT1, the CAT1B, 5G, narrowband. By the way, also uh, the option to work with the external SIM socket in addition to the, to the internal SIM. And uh, we need the flexibility uh, for the RSP and the remote pro profile and the IMZ modification for remote for this uh, solution. On top of that, uh, two additional advantage you can find in the embedded connectivity solution, which I didn't uh, mention until now, uh, you are getting a plug and play solution for the module with the connectivity inside without the need to, to combine two, two components, the SIM and the module, to get your service active. And uh, it is also a simpler solution and the uh, product from logistic aspect. It's easier and simpler to handling uh, your order and the shipment. Uh, most of the technical aspect and the installation and the soldered or connect the SIM are not required anymore when we have uh, the embed connectivity product uh, is coming as one piece. That's, uh, that's all for my part. Back to you, John. Thank you very much, uh, AL, and, uh, and Pascal to yourself as well. Um, again, I think it's, it's, it's always really good to get the combination of viewpoints. Obviously, we ourselves at Collider can bring our angle from the research side and what we see, but I think it's, it's always so beneficial to people on the webinar to see your views as well from people actually out there having these conversations with people on the ground. So um, certainly lots to take in, and uh, we've also had a, quite a few questions come in as well. Uh, the webinar, which is which is fantastic. So let us spend the rest of our time taking questions that have come in. And if you still have a question, then please feel free to submit that through the, the Q and A um, uh, function, and we will try to get to that as well. Um, firstly, and um, Pascal, here's here's one for yourself, and it's about ISIM. And yes, there's a lot of talk about ISIM, and there's you know interesting projections on ISIM in, in the industry as well. 
Um, question we had though was um, I heard there are concerns over the security of ISIM versus eSIM. How is this being addressed? Yes, there's there's a lot of concern mainly from MNO because the uh, one of the key uh, features of uh, SIM card or any UACC is to protect the MNO assets and the the MNO credentials. So of course they are very very demanding in terms of security, and they can understand the uh, the, the idea of reducing the footprint of the SIM card on the device and uh, all the other uh, interest of the uh, of the integrated SIM. But this was a key uh, this was a key topic to discuss with them. So that's why we are addressing it by working uh, from the chip design phase together with chipset makers, for the integration phase together also with uh, with module makers like Telit to make sure that we have a fully end-to-end -end solution for security that can achieve a level of security that is um, quite similar to the one of the discrete chip. Yeah. On, on the other hand, we are also uh, working on making an, uh, smaller and smaller discrete uh, products, like uh, what AL just uh, introduced, the uh, the very the SIM card or EUACC that can be sold inside the inside the module itself. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um... And then if, if, if we move on, I'll try to rattle through these as, as quick as can as I can, given the, the time. So, um, so Ail, one for yourself. So does an embedded connectivity solution, does it tie the customer to the vendor, you know, that solution forever? So no, as we, as the embedded connectivity is using the USC capabilities. So one of the USC offering or benefit is the uh, what you call customer business resilience and flexibility insurance. The IoT MVNO vendor enables the customer to avoid the MNO lock-in and use uh, other connectivity providers, mainly by uh, connect the uh, SMSR, the SMDP, the two party to, to replace the, the profile to the other one. Perfect, and, and stay with me, um, um, Ayal, as well, because um, I must go to um, Alex, who, who put probably the first question in long ago and has remained very patient. Um, so, um, so what he asked is, could an IoT or, or global provider be more convenient and competitive than a local MNO or MVNO? Yes, the uh, the idea is the, of the global is the, the the local MNO probably can get a good price for a specific location, specific country. But as soon as you are getting out from this location, or you have several uh, several profile or several uh, SIM to handle, this is where uh, the global uh, IoT MVNO is coming. Where in one place, in one uh, CMP, one management. You can handle uh, global deployment. You can send your, your your SIM all around the world with all the, the solution. As mentioned, the UICC, the multi IMSI that coming with uh, better coverage and redundancy, uh, and mainly for uh, for uh, for global deployment, uh, the the cost and the advantages is much higher. Perfect. Thank you, uh, and Alex. I hope hope that helps uh, as well. And. Um... I'm get, Stefan, I'm going to come to yourself now um, and another early question that we had this, this time from Chris um, on an area that I know that you know well. So Chris asked, how do you see the problem of the regulatory ban on permanent roaming um, that are used by many IoT solutions and how the industry you know, adopt, uh, adopts or adjusts to this? Yep, that's a, that's a good question. I think we can look back a few years to see how, how it's developed. I mean, uh, what was it, back in 2012 or so, I think uh, you had a situation in in Brazil, I believe, where I think uh, Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom, they wanted to launch solutions in, in that particular country, but of course, permanent roaming is, is banned. So they had to spend uh, quite a bit of time setting up local solutions. It really wasn't an ideal situation. Um, what we have now, of course, is um, an increased focus, first of all, on specific interoperator tariffs, uh, which mitigates some of the uh, concerns uh, around the commercial relationship for, for permanent roaming. So on the MNO side, we also see um, an increase in um, MNO interest in playing a, a wholesale role to, to support connectivity on an international level. 
Um, and we also see, of course, the emergence of technological solutions to, to, to bypass running altogether in the form, as we've as we discussed today, uh, EUICC, IUICC, and um, you know, in some instances, um, some other technical solutions as well, such as uh, core network integration and easy translation. Um, so there are several different solutions around it. Um, I, I, I suppose um, one area of uh, more concern, I would say, is not necessarily simply uh, banning permanent roaming, but uh, you know, we also see some countries where uh, cross-border data flows are, are prohibited or restricted. Uh, and in that case, um, we also see some increased activity from various providers to to establish lo either local presences. Uh, we're also seeing you know, an increase in telco infrastructure globally distributed across the world to meet some sort of uh, some of those uh, regulatory and compliance requirements. Um, so there's a lot of activity going on in the industry to to overcome um, the concerns that are being raised over permanent roaming. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. Um... And another another question actually that uh, Chris had, and, and Pascal, I'll, I'll come to yourself with this, um, if that's okay. So he asked, um, how do you see the future of profile provision for business applications? So will it will be end to end eSIM or IoT? Uh, I would say it will depend on the business application. Um, I think the, the the current solution based on the end to end specification will live on. Uh, for some application where it's already in place and working fine. Uh, I, we see also uh, strong interest from all our partners and customers in the upcoming uh, IoT specification, definitely. But those people already have usually millions of M2M EUICC uh, in the field already. So I think it will be like uh, a combination of the two, depending on uh, the actually state of the of the of the, of the industry and see how it goes on the, depending on the use case and our job will be to make sure that uh, everyone can use both their let's say legacy m2 cards and the new iot one based on consumer uh, the same way uh, in a seamless uh, solution yeah perfect no thank you let's go for that um on the way of time let us still try to squeeze another couple of questions in um so firstly um Stefan, I'll, I'll take this one to you, uh, if that's okay. So service quality and performance are not always consistent in international markets. So how is the industry looking to tackle this? And can you share some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, Ail touched on that in, in his slides when he talked about mm -hmm. uh, smaller providers and uh, resellers. You know, what ha often happens is that uh, when you have devices roaming um, internationally, then um, you don't always have full visibility over the device in terms of what's exactly going on um, at a, a signaling level, for example. Um, and that means if, uh, if a customer has a particular problem with a device, um, you often have to go through multiple touch points to solve that problem. The visited MNO might see you as a low priority customer and therefore take some time as well. Um, so, you know, as I touched on briefly just now, um, you know, there's more innovative players on the market now uh, that are, um, first of all, developing their own CMP, they're developed and launching their own dedicated IoT core infrastructure, uh, distributing that around the world, integrating with, uh, with carrier partners. Um, and that means the level of support is is really elevated to to a much higher level. So, really, uh, from a customer perspective, then you have your your single touch point um, for for the majority of cases, and that means your issues can be resolved much more simply and uh, and much more quickly. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and the final question, um, I'm going to give um, Martin's written us a. Uh, a very big question, and uh, so AL, I'm, I'm going to put that to yourself, so bear with me whilst I, I go through it. Um, but it was aligned to your presentation. So he said, um, it seems the ISIN direction with the trusted zones and encryption using resources in the cellular chipset rather than external SIM is, is the way to go. So he asks, do you see this taking off globally at some point and becoming universal, or do you expect there will always be the, the MNO somewhere requiring the, the physical 
uh, SIM chip. Yeah, we do see the, the physical, as I mentioned earlier, with, uh, and in our module, we are always uh, leaving the, the external SIM socket as an option. So we have the option to, to swap between the internal to external. Uh, we still see that the customer will do, will may need the, the traditional SIM outside. So as a backup option for this uh, embedded uh, solution for that. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, right, that's that's. Uh, I think we'll draw the line there today. Uh, so thank you, everyone, so much um, for being with us and and uh, for submitting your questions. If we haven't addressed your question today, we will certainly follow up um, after this call, um, either one of um, Stefan Ayer or, or Pascal. And I think the reminders that we would say as as, as well is do remember that you, you will be receiving shortly the white paper with all these additional findings. Um, and of course, if, if you have further questions um, that come up after the event, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. This is all about informing the industry. So I'm sure one of uh, the team at Kaleido, Telit or Idemia will be uh, happy to, to pick that up and, and get back to you. So on that note, uh, Ayer, Pascal and Stefan, thank you all so much for taking the time and, and for what you presented today. Thanks, John. Thank you, John, for hosting us. Thank you, John. Yeah, and thank you as well to, to the audience for being with us. So uh, stay well, and uh, we hope to uh, welcome you on another webinar soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.